Hello everyone, I'm Elijah Henderson from Cryptid Studies Institute here in historic Harlan County, Kentucky. I originate from a small town at the base of a mountain in Tennessee. My peace, my bliss, and my comfort are deeply rooted in Appalachia. There is a settling in of awe just going home to those mountains that invigorate your very bones. But being from those mountains in East Tennessee gives you a bit of lonesome in your soul, an ingrained yearning feel of nostalgia. You might even say you have an Appalachian soul. There's just something in your blood. The men have calloused hands, wear flannel and car hearts, and the ladies, ah, the ladies, they are something special. Those Appalachian princesses. Of course, in those sacred mountain ranges and our hills and hollers, our girls don't wear glass slippers, they wear flip flops. Mountain life moves at a slower pace. The culture is far removed from any other culture out there. We have our own burial rites our own way of courting and pitch and woo. We have our own oral traditions, lore and legends, and we ever share secrets that we don't just share with any old peckerwood or jasper. We make our own liquor. Hunting and fishing are just a way of life, and in many cases it almost seems like mountain folk are tied to the land. And even if we've moved or have been extracted, it leaves an ache like having a tooth removed or losing a limb, a type of phantom pains if you will. My mountain home, while not considered to be coal country, per se, was itself rich with coal and was home to many mines. The coal industry was strong there for many years. Many a good man worked and died in those East Tennessee mines. Some fell victim to black lung. Others perished in cave-ins and explosions. In fact, we have a forthcoming nightmare nugget on a supposed haunted mine. My family has traced part of our bloodline to Eastern Kentucky, in a small mining community called Harlan County, Kentucky. And outside of my hometown, I've never found another town that felt so much like home. The town is nestled in the mountains, in the very heart of coal country. And the people, although most have never gotten a fair shake in this world, are genuinely good-hearted and well-meaning, but they don't suffer fools well. As life in Harlan has never been easy, and is considered one of the poorest places in the entire nation, with 32.6% of the population living below the poverty line, whereas the rest of our great country hovers somewhere around 13.1%. The good people of Harlan are hit much harder with economic woes than even the inner cities in the biggest metropolises America has to offer. Coal mining has for many years been a main source of revenue for the hard-working people of Harlan, and even that has come with a price. Over the years, there have been many contentious disagreements between the coal industry's company men, the unions, and the men in the field who risk their lives on a daily basis digging out the richest part of those mountains. The men, and I suppose women, who spend long hours deep underground in perilous conditions, breathing coal dust and other pollutants just to supply for their families. Many times the exchanges between the company, the unions, and the employees became heated and led to violence and eventually the town acquired the unfortunate nickname of Bloody Harlan. Having said all that, we here at Cryptid Studies Institute have been alerted to certain goings-on of a rather mysterious nature that, if true, could lead Harlan to be called Bloody yet again, but for all new reasons. In early 2019, Cryptid Studies Institute came to Harlan to take part in the local cryptid con where we met and became instant friends with some simply amazing individuals, such as Jimmy Blanton and his lovely wife Missy, the Chadwick family, members of the Lankford family, fellow researcher Michael Cook, and many others. And we felt an instant kinship to these individuals, 
and so we have kept in touch and have gone back to visit on occasion. We also had the opportunity to interview several locals about some of their eyewitness encounters, and a few were somewhat frightening and overlap a series of strange happenings that have been ongoing for a while, with some of those happenings dating all the way back to the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s and beyond. I'm perplexed as to where to start with such a full plate of eerie and unique encounters. I suppose the best place to start is at the beginning, all the way back at the Cryptid Con, when another researcher approached us in a rather excited manner to give us his thoughts and ideas on the subject of giants, as he had noticed a fossil replica that we had on display. The before-mentioned replica was of a giant human femur that was purported to have been found around the 1950s in Turkey. However, some earlier reports claimed that it was in Egypt. Interestingly enough, both accounts state that the out-of-place artifact was found during the construction of a highway system. The enormous femur measures in at a whopping 48 inches and would have belonged to an individual 12 to 15 feet tall, which is in harmony with the biblical narrative because King Og was said to have slept on an iron bed large enough to have accommodated an individual that was around 12 feet tall. But I'm getting off track here. The fossil itself is not the point here. Rather, the conversation. Our new friend began to tell us that he thought that the giants were an amalgamation of angels and man brought about by illicit and forbidden procreation when the sons of God saw the daughters of man and took them as wives. To him, they were all the Nephilim spoken of in the Holy Scriptures. We share a different view and explain that we think that the sons of God statement actually refers to the godly line of Seth, Adam's son, mingling their seed with the profane posterity of Cain, the daughters of man. As we were talking, he said something that caught my attention good and proper. He conveyed to us that some giant human skeletons had been found in a cave in Harlan some years back and were now in the possession of a state university. I instantly began to wonder if these gargantuan bones could have actually belonged to a Sasquatch, and I set about to see if I could locate any evidence for the skeletal anomaly. I was fortunate enough to find two corroborating sources in the form of newspaper articles, and this lit a fire under us to want to spend more time in Harlan to do a little research. But by the end of the day of the cryptid con, we knew that we would definitely have to come back and launch an investigation, as we met so many individuals who not only claimed to know someone who had experienced an encounter, but had experienced one themselves. Here are a few accounts told in their own words, and while I cannot guarantee that everyone was truthful, I'm not going to call them a liar. It takes a brave person to come forward and open up about an experience so jarring as a cryptid sighting. We like to give people the benefit of the doubt until we have proof that they are being deceptive. We'll play the tapes and you guys can judge for yourselves. As for us, we walked away convinced that something or things were roaming the hills and the hollers of Harlan, Kentucky. We wanted to do something a bit different this time and bring you part of the interviews that we conducted in this nugget. And we'll post the interviews in their entireties over on our Cryptid Studies Plus page, our secondary channel. The first one that we want to start with is a very sweet lady that we met who resides right there in Harlan County. And while her encounter took place in a neighboring state, we included it to give you a feel for the warmth and openness of the good people of Harlan County. Once again, here at the Crypticon in Harlan, Kentucky, and I'm sitting here with Matt Wonder's your name? Wendy Lockery. Wendy Lockery. And Wendy, you've got something to tell us that you saw when you were 12. <laughs> tell us all about it, you know. Um, my family used to camp in Romney, West Virginia. And we used to go down there every year. Well, I was 12, and me and my sister, it was back in the woods. We, we camped. And there was train tracks. And me and my sister went up on the train tracks. And across the road was a house slaves built. Nobody lived in it. And I heard something come running. I mean, you could hear it run. And I seen a deer jump the fence. Mm -hmm. And my, me and my sister just watched the deer. Well, behind the deer, there was something else. And it landed straight, I mean, like, like jumped the fence and landed straight in front of me and my sister. And my sister was scared. I stood up in front of my sister. And it stood in front of me, and I'll never forget. It was real tall. And it had, like, long arms, though. And, but its hair was like a, a darkish gray, like a grayish brown. And it looked down at me. I remember it looking down at me, and I just froze. And it turned 
and went right after the deer. Do you know what the facial features look like? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was like it was like a man. It looked like a man, but it had um, it had real soft eyes. Like real soft eyes, and I wasn't afraid. When you say soft, kind of like kind. Of kind eyes. eyes. It was not afraid. Of, I mean, I, I was not afraid of it, and I mean, I was shocked because this big thing's standing in front of me, and it, it had to go. I know. I mean, I'm 12 years old, but at that time, it it looked like a, you know, a giant. And it didn't but have a snout or anything. It did had no. It, no, it had a man man facial features, but hair. And um, it was like a grayish brown. It looked sort of, if you ask me, it looked old. And it had real long arms that, it, it was all covered in fur. Did you happen to see the feet? Uh, no, I did not see the feet. Well, I'd seen the whole thing, right. but I didn't really pay attention. Yeah, I'm straight up. up. No, yeah. the eyes, like, you and I had, they had like, uh, they were like, and stuff like that. Yeah, was, yeah. Was like they were like a down. solid, like a stuff. solid. And no whites? Uh, the white was like real thin. I seen. I remember the solidness of them, but, but I remember white, kind. Thin, yes, but I remember not being afraid. Like so, I knew he wasn't going to hurt me or her, whatever it was. So it seemed more gentle nature, but it was yes. seemed to be hunting. Abs to absolutely. Yeah, it was hunting the deer. I'm telling you, it was hunting the deer. Do you remember if it had a more kind of uh, roundish head, more conical? It, it had more conical. It was more conical than it was. I mean. I don't know, it looked like, to me it looked like a giant gorilla, only with a, a man face, more of a man face. And that's what it looked, and I'll never forget this to this day. Did you happen to see hands or anything? Oh yeah, his hands was like real long, but they were to his side. And the nails, the nails were like out, they were probably maybe that far out. Kind of square? Yeah, like, yeah, uh, like, like, like they were square. Okay. Yeah. That, that is awesome, awesome. I'll story. never forget it. I went home and told, we went I, We went over to our camp. My sister wouldn't move. She went in shock. She was laying on the uh, railroad track and she was scared to death. Wow. And I took her down and I wasn't afraid at all. It didn't hurt me, didn't bother. Oh, the smell, the smell come from it was so rank. And even as a child, 12 years old, I knew it was rank. So it had to be pretty bad. <laughs> and we went over the hill back to our camp and I told my grandmother and she was like you stay away from the tracks don't go near that house and we'd hear something all the time there was like a, an inlet beside of our camp mm -hmm. our trailer we had a trailer there pulled in and uh, there was like an inlet of water and I'd hear stuff in there all the time and my grandma would say you stay away from there and you stay away from the old house and we was that never allowed to go yeah oh yeah yeah Had but she she, uh, she said she did she said that she saw something a long time ago just to stay away from there and that's all she would say did she have a name for it no she, she, it? she wouldn't she wouldn't name it she wouldn't call it i did i did when i was older i learned you know what it was called it was a bigfoot and that's exactly what i saw what i saw first time i seen a picture that's what i saw did it look like the, the famous like this image here, kind of, or like the one that. Uh, or, or the I think it looked like that. And it looked like the, now um, the Bob, the, the yes, uh, his his it looked like that, but the eyes were like softer. The, of course, you can't really see the eyes on that just when he turns. But um, and I'd say it's like any kind of animal. Yes. Just good tempered ones yes, I agree. And you hear all these stories, these bad stories about them all the time. And I'm like, the one I seen, he or she, whatever it was, the bigfoot I saw, was was not me. Was not me. You, you hear, of, like I said, good ones and bad ones. You know, you hear of ones that run people plumb out of the forest, and then you hear of ones that are, are kind and gentle. Like yeah, that. yeah. And the one it didn't touch me and my sister. Didn't have no, you know, no use for us at all. Just to say, yeah, I'm here, and off he went oh, after the deer. Yep, he sure did. He or she did. Whatever. Did you ever see it again? No, I never saw. It. Now I, I moved up in a trailer in Wheeling, West Virginia, and my friend had taken her son to the bottom of the hill, and I had never explored the forest around there. And we went into the woods, and her and her son went to the uh, hill. And she swore she saw something back by the tree. 
that was big and black is what she said. But she saw a shadow is what she saw. And she said it was just staring at her. But I don't know what it was because I wasn't down there. And I was like, that'd be totally cool if I saw a glass. Yeah, that'd be like winning the It would. I would. <laughs> I would say he's going to come out of the woods and marry me one day. <laughs> He might, might do that. <laughs> but no, that's my story. Well, I appreciate you sharing yes, that. Now, as we stated, her encounter did not occur in Harlan, but there are other Bigfoot sightings that have happened there, and you'll hear about that in a few moments. In fact, there is alleged to be some sort of cryptid there among the menagerie of baleful and bizarre beasties that roam and haunt this small mountain town and its hills and hollers, that stalks along the old railway system, that is white like a polar bear, standing seven or eight feet tall, that is similar to a Sasquatch. The mysterious monster that walks along the tracks is not the only creature to be spied there on the railroad tracks of Harlan, and our next interviewee came forward to share her allegedly true tale with us of a dogman that she and a friend crossed paths with on a dismal stretch of railway she even produced what she maintains is evidence of her forbidding chance encounter with the unusual, a large stone which is furrowed with a series of claw-like etchings. Did she see it? Was it a dog, man? You listen and you decide. Well, uh, we're here at, where are we at? We're, we're at Harlan County, Kentucky, at CryptoCon, and we're talking with... Brandy Lee. Brandy Lee. And Brandy has uh, something interesting to tell us all. Brandy, what do you got for us? Well, my story is um, me and my my uh, family member, we were walking down the road, when, and it was kind of daylight, and uh, we saw this thing with a hump on its back and a snout, and I was like, well, maybe it's just a bear. And when it kept going further, it was kind of slouching. And... It was walking across the railroad tracks, and we kind of got scared, and we kind of hid behind some bushes, and we kind of watched it. And my sister and my sister was kind of scared of me, and so we kind of tried to back out, <laughs> so we so the thing wouldn't see us. What was it on two legs? Or two legs. Two legs. Yes. Now, how tall was it? Uh, about probably as tall as a bear, maybe. It was pretty big, maybe 500 pounds. And did it stay on two legs? Or? Yes. So not like a bear shuffling? And... Oh, no. No, and it had a tail and everything. I thought, well, maybe it's just a homeless person. I kept telling myself, maybe I'm just wondering if I'm seeing things or not. But then I saw the, the rock thing that I got there, and it had claw marks on it. So... And there's been dead things, and we've had missing chickens, and our neighbors had missing chickens. Now, what color fur did it have? Was it covered from head to toe in fur? Yes, it was kind of black. It was black? Yes. Was it more thin or more shaggy? Oh, no. It was shaggy, and it was big. It was really thick. How far away from it were you? Um, maybe like... Um, few miles or so I'm I, that's kind of yes I wasn't in a car no bike nothing nothing was keeping me actually <laughs> from it how did you see it from miles away it was maybe like a few maybe like a mile or so I'm, oh, okay. I'm so just guessing like so yes. it may not have even been a mile You're just it was down mile. the road oh, it was down the road so yes then eyesight down the road oh yes okay yes alright I just wanted to go somehow I'll always go how you see it miles away. Uh, we believe it's really funny. Thank you. Know, you. We, we hear stuff like this a lot. Uh, so it's big, it's black, walking on two legs. Did it have ears? Could you tell that? Yes, it was kind of pinned back. It was what? Pinned back. Kind of pinned back? Yes. Like uh, flared back? Like it was yes. annoyed? Or? Well, it was kind of stalking. Like it was stalking something. It kind of looked stalky. Like it didn't want to be, it was trying to get by, but didn't want, want no one to see it. Could you see its eyes by any stretch of the No. No, too far away. Uh, did it seem like a natural creature or something? It seemed pretty natural. It seemed real. If you had to put it in your words, uh, what would you say you saw? I saw a dog man. It was a 
dog man. That's awesome. Now is that in Kentucky or another state? That's here in Kentucky. Do you mind telling what county? You don't have to tell the region. Har- Harlan. Harlan County. Yes. Now Harlan is not very far from the Daniel Boone National Forest where we've heard the reports of dog man. Wow. Several times. See, I never thought they would be here. It kind of shocks me. Well, it kind of makes me want to stay in Harlem a little longer. <laughs> it absolutely does. But that is amazing. You said you've had other experiences. What else you have? Like knocking and stuff. We hear growling and stuff around the house at night. Or do you live way out in the county? Or? I live right past from here. Just a few miles from here. It's still pretty rural, though, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. Now, do you think that was more supernatural in nature or no. natural? It looked natural. That's awesome. That's very cool. I have to wonder if perhaps these and other such wayfaring creatures are using the railroad system as an easy travel route through these mountain gaps and passes. They would be able to pass on virtually unnoticed and unhindered, especially if they are nocturnal travelers. It makes sense that they would take the path of least resistance. I have also considered the possibility that they make their way through the cavernous systems carved throughout the very limestone of the Appalachian Mountains themselves, and possibly even along the Appalachian Trail. Of course, that is only a theory, though. Let us know if you've ever heard of any evidence that seems to support any of these theories, as we crave your support and opinions and your theories as well. This is how we learn, by shared knowledge, because we know of no true experts in the field. Even though many would claim such an exalted title for themselves, personally, we consider an attitude like that to be hubris in its highest form. We understand that we don't have all the answers, but what answers we do have, we'll gladly share free of charge. We may not always tell the exact location where an encounter happened if we believe that it could present a danger to someone or if it betrays a confidence. Our next interview was, in our opinion, one of our favorites, as it covered a number of topics, but we are going to only share a portion of that interview here due to time constraints, but we'll post the rest in its entirety on our secondary channel called Cryptid Studies Plus. This next part ties directly into another ongoing harassment by an assumed dogman on the other side of the county. Give this next portion a listen and I'll explain more. My uncle's friend, her name's Evelyn Lynch, lives up in a place around here called Smith. And now she says that they come into her yard, that they push her vehicles down the driveway and stuff These like that. These are dogmen. Yes. They stand, they got like the human kind of like body covered hair. They stand up straight, but they have like the Anubis feet, like the three toes. And then the head of... Now, are, are the legs bent back in dog food? Yes. You, you got a friend who actually has them push her car. Yeah. And, and could you describe them again? From the way that, he's, that they described it, it was about six, seven foot tall. Okay. Muscular, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, kind of heavy in the chest and seven legs that bent back like that and then the three toes like that Nubis and said that the head was like a German Shepherd is the way that they described it uh, less wolfy than yeah yeah kind of like that and the only other story I know is my papa they lived in an area up that way too called uh, Bob's Creek and he lived in a house kind of down the little valley and something would come up on his porch all the time and he ended up shooting it in the foot and the way he described it was the same as that as a dog and my uncle then moved into that house and you would hear it come now i heard that it would come up on the porch and you would hear it drag its foot when it come up there so it was it was lame then (laughs) yes after my papa shot it yeah (laughs) and did this take place in harlan county yes So that's like the third account the, in Harlan County we've heard of a dog man today. Second or third one, yeah. If you want, the best place if you're going to look for anything like that would be go up to Smith. It's, yeah, I don't know how to explain that, area. where you would get to it. Google a place called K-Wood, the turn off to Smith. K-Wood? K-Wood. C-A-W-O-O-D. Yeah. Okay. And then you head up towards what we call Martin's Fork Lake and all the way up through there, Smith. And... 
Lord have mercy. There was, you hear a lot of stories up there. Yeah, like that. Y'all ever heard of anybody being killed by one of them? Or no. mauled or anything of that nature? No. Most of the time, any stories that I've heard is they don't really come around. There's when people are around, or if they do, it's a sighting and both parties run when they see each other. So, yeah. If you listen close enough, you heard Jamie state that a dog man used to come around harassing her grandfather's home, coming up on the porch, basically just being a nuisance and an undetermined threat, until her grandfather was able to shoot and wound the creature in the foot, leaving it partially lame with a deformed foot, missing a crescent moon-shaped piece of its hind foot, injuring the unwelcome visitor, and it was so damaged that it had to drag its ruined extremity around. The frightening thing about this harassment is that even though the creature had been shot and had its foot savaged by a gun, the determined wolfish monstrosity continued to come around undeterred. Now skip forward a couple of years, and a family some 10, possibly 20 miles across the county and over the mountain range is being terrorized by nightly terror that they thought they had seen the last of in the 80s. I'll try to give you the cliff notes before I play you the interview of a fellow researcher who contacted us with questions about the dogman phenomenon as she and her teammates attempted to help the terrified family that is still being stalked by something unseemly, unnatural, evil, and aberrant. From what we've been able to gather and piece together from several conversations, the unfortunate family was first accosted by the lupine menace in the early to mid-1980s. The individuals involved were far from wealthy. In fact, they got on by rather meager means, and while their lives wouldn't be described as idyllic, they were happy in their little mountain home, and even decided to raise a few head of livestock, sheep, I believe. Unfortunately, with the advent of their livestock, the terror came calling, as something sinister entered into their lives, causing them to question the natural order of things. I don't want to diminish from the interviewee's account of the events, so I will say that some creature, some dark thing, would come by night and kill their sheep, removing the head and leaving the body. The torments in the 80s suddenly just stopped, and time marched forward, and now the terrors have begun again with a vengeance. And one of the nightly intruders has a strangely damaged hind foot that seems to match up perfectly to the one shot by the grandfather of the last interview that we played. The next interview was very long, and we'll play the whole thing as it discusses Goatman, Bigfoot, and the dogmen that are currently stalking and terrifying three families there in Harlan. As the interview plays, we will include a few brief video clips and stills that we recorded back in October when we came to Harlan to do a bit of investigating at the behest of friends that we made in the county. Unfortunately, we came on a weekend when the region was engulfed in a very cold, torrential rainfall. We were scheduled to go back in the spring, but unfortunately, COVID has caused us to postpone until later in the fall. I would now like you to give a listen to Marcella and James Chadwick and Jimmy Blanton of Paranormal Chaos. Uh, we're here with Marcella Chadwick uh, here in Harlan County and Jimmy Blanton. Uh, two local researchers and fine people, if I might say so myself. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you've been. Uh, we've been talking about on the phone, if you don't mind. Okay, we have been talking about local goat man sightings, local Bigfoot sightings, and what we think, not sure, but are leaning toward being dog men. Well, all right. Uh, which one do you care to tell us about first? Um, we'll go goat man. That seems to be, we get a lot of reports of goat man. Um, it's like dirty old goats, right? No, no different kind. <laughs> we get a lot of those too. But uh, tonight we're going to talk about the the, the cryptic goat man. How's that? The what? The cryptic goat, goat man. Not the creepy goat man. No, not the creepy old goat man. We're going to talk about the cryptic. Um, actually, it's a family member that's involved. Um, my biological mother, when she was nine year old, she was out playing baseball, which all the kids in the neighborhood did. And the only rule they had back then was you had to be home by dark. Um, and so it got, time got away from her, and she started home. And we live on the north side of the mountains. Of course, we got dark before everybody else. Um, as she was heading home, she kept hearing something walking behind her. As um, she would turn and wouldn't see anything, 
the closer she got to home, I, I think she started to panic a little bit. And when she would tell the story, the sound in the voice, she might start panicking a little bit. But she knew something was there, but wasn't seeing it at first. Um, but as she was walking home, she started to hear what sounded like, the way she explained, maybe a baby crying. A little, a little baby. She said a, a young baby crying. And she turned to look, and there stood what she called at that time the dope boy. It wasn't much bigger than her. It had hair from the waist down. Um, it had horns. And she said the scariest thing about it was the eyes looked like goat's eyes. That was the scariest part she remembered, looking at its eyes and seeing them look just like a goat's eyes. Well, at that point, she took to running. But when she would run, it would run. When she would stop, it would stop. So she ran until she could yell out for her mother, which is my grandmother, and when my grandmother came out on the porch, as she was running home, she saw it, too. Now, this thing followed my biological mother for 20 years until she finally got married and moved to Virginia. Not consecutively. Well, she saw it everywhere. If she went on a date and walked home, it was there. Right, but it wasn't every minute of every day. No, 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 not consecutively. No, it, it, it was usually only at night. And, um, like I said, there was no road to our house, so her dates would have to drop her off on the main road, and she would have to walk home. So, she lived largely in the same area for a lot of years? Yes. Okay. Where I live now. Yeah. Same area. So, it would usually be mostly along the same road to the house? Yeah, but now we do have roads. <laughs> Back then, they just had a path. Right. Yeah. So, uh, what they called a cow path is what they called it. That's what everybody had going to their house from the main road. So, um, but she saw it, it, she went on a date, um, there was, she did get married the first time and lived in the same area, they would build a cabin around from where mom and dad and my grandparents lived, and she saw it there, it bothered her there, she heard it one night on the roof, she thought it was trying to tear the roof up, she heard it, it would throw stuff and hit the roof and try to get her to come outside, she said she felt like it wanted her to come outside make noise, her husband heard it, saw it. And never tried to harm him in any way? Never tried to harm anybody, just aggravate, I guess and you would say. to get her attention. To get her attention. And then she divorced that guy and moved to Virginia and never seen it. The whole time she was in Virginia, it just she completely forgot about it. Until they ended up divorcing and she moved that back, and then it started right back where it left off, except now it was a much bigger, older... <laughs> Version of what she man. Yes, that man. And what was the, the coloring on this? It was um, a yellowish brown, the way she explained it. Yellowish brown. Now, Jimmy, do you get reports of goat men around here as well? Uh, no, it's actually been quite a while since I've had a report on anything. Uh, a lot of reports come to me. It's usually in the fall months throughout the winter. Right. Uh, a lot of folks report Bigfoot. Well, they're probably out in the... Out and about more in the winter and the fall. Yeah, especially in this this area of the U.S., uh, especially southeastern Kentucky and all the way up the East Coast. A lot of the reports are mainly this time of year. Uh, a lot of folks like to get out during the summer months, but I'm thinking you'd have a creature that size, that big, dense fur. They would be smart to, in the summer months, stay where it's cooler. Where it's cooler. And then, you know, of the cooler months, get out and do what you have to do. You know? and whether it's like uh, migrating or some folks think they migrate. Uh, I really, myself, I don't think they do that. And, and it's possible they, they don't, you know. Uh, I don't know that any of us know exactly what's going on with them. But exactly. I would say they do stay out of the heat as much as possible. I would think so. I was that hairy. I'd want to be out of the heat. Oh yeah. So do you do you still get reports, Marcella, of, of Goatman? I get reports of Goatman a lot. Now you took us somewhere tonight up on a mountain. You don't have to get the location, but uh, you say there's a lot of reports of both Bigfoot and Goatman on that mountain. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where I saw whatever it was that I saw. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. It was about this time of the year. It was 2017. It was about this time of the year. I had a camera and a boom, well, the boom guy didn't go with us. We had a camera guy. And we went up there. We had got several reports of a, I was looking for a ghost is why I went. 
there were several reports from some very believable officials, I guess I should say it that way, that a mist would come off the mountain where we stopped, where I stopped and showed you right. guys, in the form of a woman, and you would hear a woman hollering help, and it would cross the road in front of you. That's what we were there to get. That's why we went to that location, was to try to get that on film and maybe communicate. So I'm driving, and we pull up exactly where I stopped, and um, I got out of the vehicle and went to the back to get some equipment out, and at first I thought I saw a cinnamon-colored bear because it looked like it was maybe bent over like a bear. You know, you can see its back. And I'm like, um, I told the camera guy, this one, I could look, there's a cinnamon-colored bear. And he's working, he goes, where? And he comes around the back corner and he looks. And about the time he comes around, he stands up on two legs. And I'm like, oh, blank. That's not a bear. <laughs> and he goes, oh, my God, what is that? And it literally steps up on the road. You've seen the, it was nothing for it to step up on top of the road, take two steps to be across the road, then two steps up that embankment and going up the ridge. That was gone. Well, it gets, he didn't have time to get a picture. No, he, he it was over. He was done. When he saw that, he was completely done. He didn't want nothing else to do with that area. <laughs> it gets about halfway up the mountain, and I reach over and unlatch my gun. Because this thing's totally hairy. This is not what you, when people tell you about Bigfoot, this is not what I imagined, okay? This thing had hair. It was totally hairy. There was no facial feature you could see. It was just hair. So I am longer hair, longer hair, red, like cinnamon color bear. You know, they're red, like a chow, right. a chow dog. That's way I can explain it. Um, and I unhooked my gun and put my hand over my gun, and it stopped about halfway up the hill. And I looked at it, and this is what I said. I said, I don't want to have to shoot you, but I will. And it just, like it understood me, and just went on up the hill. So I'm telling the guy with me, I was like, just calm down. Okay, let's do what we're here to do. Let's see if we can get this ghost. He's like, no, I just want to leave. I just want to leave. I just really, really want to leave. I can't be here. And I'm like, you've been doing this for how many years now? He goes, nine years. I've never seen anything like that. I want to go. And I'm like, let's just get what we're here to get. And every time he would kick on that camera, he'd go, oh, my God, it's looking around the tree. There's a big tree up there. And I still smelled it. You could, When the wind would come down, it was like a, imagine a thousand wet dogs have been sprayed by skunk. That's the best way I can explain it. You would smell that coming off that breeze. And he swore, I never saw it looking from around behind the tree. I did not. But he swore it was up on top of the mountain watching us. When he would look around, it would be watching, that he would see his head watching around the tree. So I had to put him in the vehicle and bring him back to Harlem because he was, I was afraid he was going to have a heart attack. Now this is close to the same area that Jim, you said that a, a gentleman you talked to had found large footprints not far from. Yeah, uh, the, gen the elderly gentleman said um, during uh, times when we would have forest fires in the area, the uh, forest division would like to pile up trees and stuff there, and uh, neighboring folks up there would cut it up, you know, to dispense out to other folks. He had went up there, was uh, looking around, getting wood when he noticed a big footprint right there by the pile. And he said that they went in a straight line over the embankment. Uh, he broke a stick in the length of the footprint. When he got it home, he took a tape measure out measuring it. was 18 inches. That's a big footprint. Yes. Wow. He didn't follow them to see where they went. No. He, uh, he kinda probably liked, wise decision. You know, he kind of like got out of Dodge. He didn't want to stick around to see the size of the creature that made them. So. And this elderly man now has dementia. And uh, it would be kind of hard for me to follow up on a report as bad as I would like to, you know, talk to him at the time. He's just not in the right mental, mental state. I understand to. very much so. We've dealt with dementia before. Now, you've also had reports of dog men in the county, too, haven't you? I think me and Jimmy both got yes, reports. I believe, I believe that is what we're thinking. Uh, the one area that Marcel has been looking at, too, is possible, uh, strongly possible, thank you. Now, without getting too personal with with these individuals' uh, account, can you give us a brief overview of what they're dealing with and a little bit of the history? I can. Um, I'll just leave the names and location out. How's that? Yes. Now, the location's not far. Well, it, it is far. 
there's a place called Smith where I got a report from. Yes. And as the crow flies, how far would that be in a straight line and not going up and down the mountain? Could an animal that size go from one to two? All it would have to do is go over one, two mountains. Yeah, two mountains. So ten miles, maybe. If that, if that, if that, so mm -hmm. uh, a creature that size with such a large gait, it, it would be very easy for it to make that distance. Yeah, these things seem to be pretty quick anyway, you know. Um, I got a call from a lady who was very upset, um, and she told me there was strange things that were terrorizing her and her family. And the way she explained it to me at first, I thought maybe we were dealing with a couple mountain lions. And I asked her, I said, could these be mountain lions? She goes, they don't make mountain lions this big. And mountain lions don't walk on two feet. So that kind of caught my attention. I, I would think so. Yeah, and I was like, okay, what are we dealing with here? And she goes into detail, and she tells me that um, these things would let out this blood-curdling howl. And they have a, and she called me on the phone one night, and this thing's howling, and this guttural growl is just, it's like it vibrates when it growls. You feel it. And I said, okay, something's not right here. This is not anything I've ever dealt with. And I'm pretty sure it's not a Bigfoot. So um, after much investigation and talking to these people, it got to the point where they had goats. And whatever this was, was killing the goats and only taking the head. And you can see where the head had been gnawed off. I mean, you can see the gnawing. Maybe a tablespoon or two of blood with all the blood loss. It was like the blood's being sucked out of these animals. It was the strangest thing. And um, after working with her for a while and seeing, I finally got to see the footprints, and they blown me away. Imagine the world's largest raccoon times 20. Right. That was the front feet. The back feet looked like kind of like a dog, an elongated dog paw, if that makes sense. A very elongated dog paw. There's something wrong with one of the back One paws. of the back paw, the uh, one on the left side is half missing. It's either been in a trap, shot off, or something. It's half gone. It's like in a half moon shape, like that. It's cut off. So, something's happened to it. And this started after the family removed a, a pool or something. Well, they had been seeing them before that, and but they hadn't been getting really close to their home. But once they removed that pool, is when they started getting strangely close. You know, it was un, un, it was weird for them to get that close. And uh, this is 20 foot from the back door. And I believe you told me one time that they had uh, had some trouble of a similar nature back in the 80s. Yes, they did. Or was this a different there. family? <clears throat> no, this was some family. They first moved there in the 80s, and they had issues. It was a very wooded area, and they had bought sheep to clean their property. Right. So they could take trees down and make a yard and all that. And this was happening to the sheep. But they never saw what was doing it to the sheep. They never knew what was killing the sheep and taking the head. But it was the same story. Only the head of the sheep, the body would be laying there. And um, there's an older gentleman, he's in his upper 80s, that lives at the bottom of this mountain they live on. And he, I tried talking to him, and he did not want to talk about it. He said, little lady, if you keep talking about this, you're going to talk it back up to where the point it was at in the so I caught these things have been there for a while, whatever it is. He knew so this exactly what they were. Going problem. Yeah. yeah. He knew this old man knows exactly what they are, but he's not gonna talk about them. He says the more you talk about them, the more they show up. So what what were they able to do to stop the harassment in the eighties? They they didn't do anything, they didn't know what to do. It just kinda of stopped on it, it it died down for a while. And then um it started back. And is it more ramped up now than it was it in the was, 80s? It's a lot more ramped up now than it was in the 80s. I believe you told me that they had to uh, put a fencing or something. They went and bought the high-tension electric fencing. They went in debt. All three of these families did up this road. So there's more than one family. There's more than one. There's three families up this road that's been terrorized by these things. They bought the high-tension the high um, electrical wire and put it up around their property. They still hear them holler. They still make that screaming sound or whatever you want to call it and that growl, but they don't get close. It's like they've learned that that wire hurts or either their electricity running through it is keeping them at bay. And they can hear. Yeah. You said they, uh, when they removed the, the 
pool, it sounded like one of them might have been scratching her claw on the side of the She house. said the night they removed the pool, she called me, and she was really tore up that day. And she was, she said, last night, she said, it sounded like Freddy Krueger, you know, how he has those knives. She said, it sounded like it drugged down the side of our house. And that's when they found the print in the sand where the pool had been removed the next morning. And didn't I, I, I get so many stories from people that I can't keep up with. But was it you that told me that they it'll leave their dead goat? It leaves the body. But where they can actually see yeah. it, like it's taunting them. Almost. Yeah, it leaves it. It leaves it in the yard, up, coming up the driveway. It just leaves it somewhere where they're going to see it. There's just no head. So do they get the sense that it's being malicious or just like an animal that's eating or? No, because she feels like it's doing it on purpose because she said if it was one to eat, it would have took the whole goat. It wouldn't have took the head and just left the body. Do they ever find the heads? No. They never They've never found the head. Wow. I asked her that. that was I said, okay, where did you find the head? She goes, we've never found the head. Of the sheep or the goat. Or the, you think of all these dogs. headless goats that, goats that they found in the river down there in uh, Georgia. They had two hunting dogs, and something happened to them. They found their bodies. Well, you can see the gnawing, or that the head's been gnawed off. You can see that. So, uh, county-wise, there are a lot of people who have animals come up missing? And... There's a lot of, quite a bit of animals that come up missing. From what I understand, there's a lot of people come up missing here. There's a lot of people missing here that there's no explanation for right now. Over the past 10 years had an influx of possible people in the hooded areas down here in Harlem, big time. And at least one missing a head, and the head showed up later in auto. Now, you also mentioned something about a, a white thing that would walk down the railroad track. Would you mind mentioning that? He knows about that. That's, <laughs> that's been happening for years. People where he grew up seen it for years and years. What does it look like? Is it uh, what did they explain to you? From first thing, just walking. It's just white. I kind of look like a little bit like a white bear, like an albino bear. Is it tall or on two legs or four legs? The unusual for it to be a bear that's doing, doing that much walking because they only walk a short distance. That's where the people in the community said, imagine a polar bear with a smooth face walking on two legs. Yeah, because bears tend to shuffle a short distance and then drop back down on. No. Well, that's pretty interesting. And it's an awkward walk, too. Yeah. I, I mean, there's been a ton of people tell me about that on those railroad tracks. But they said, imagine a polar bear walking on two legs with a smooth up face, not that big, long polar bear face. His face is black. So you guys almost have a. Uh, Smorgasbord of cryptid activity. I don't know if we have a smorgasbord of cryptid activity. We're putting really good drugs in our water. <laughs> There's a lot of craziness, you know, yeah. wise going on in the county that a lot of folks want to talk about because they're afraid of being ridiculed. And of course, in this area, there's a lot of proud people. Right. Well, I find that throughout the whole mountain range of Appalachia, you know, people are private. You know, in my own hometown, you know, they don't want you. Uh, talking about it, they're like, well, them old Peckerwoods over there just be, you know, trying to make fun of us, or make us crazy, or ready for the exactly. nervous hospital, and they just won't talk about it. That's like the people with what we think is dog men. It took me to hurt me forever to get her to trust me, to know that I wasn't going to make fun of her, because somebody in the crypto world had been there and had made a big mockery, tried to make a mockery of her, so she was afraid to talk to us. So she would have she had pictures of it and everything yeah, and deleted them. Because he made fun of it. That is truly unfortunate. Well, man, I, I appreciate you guys telling the story. Yes, good. Jimmy, uh, you mentioned something about a Thunderbird. Would you mind mentioning something about that? Oh, yeah. I got a report last year about a Thunderbird sighting up at our area lake up here. It's called Martin's Fork. Uh, at first led me, I thought maybe it could be impossible to miss sighting of an eagle because there are a large group of bald eagles up there in that area. 
and maybe it was just misidentification of that. But the guys told me that no, he said I've seen bald eagles around here. He lives in that area up there. He says this was not an eagle. He said this thing was like four times the size of a bald eagle. And here they get big. I'm talking like three foot tall. I've seen them standing in the road up there. Uh, at least a wingspan of 12 foot. They're huge. Especially the uh, the males have the white head. Females are more of the brown color. The females tend to be smaller than the males. But now the males are huge, and he said there was no way that this was a. Did he gave like he did like a physical? He said it was a dark, dark color. He said, kind of remind you of a mahogany brown. A mahogany brown. And did he give kind of an estimate on what the wingspan was? He said it looked like at the distance. He said, he said to him it was upwards of twenty foot. That would that big would bird. be a very big bird, very large territory. And at least probably the size where it could carry somebody off. Easily. Easily. Harlan County, it, from what I can tell from just the couple times I've been here, still seems like it's a very wild place as far as nature. Very dense uh, vegetation. Uh, a really wild community. And uh, a lot of places for something to hide and, and roam and rain. Is the paranormal activity kind of... Heavy it here. here. It is through the roof. You would hear. You will hear more if you talk to about. I'm sure if you ask each person here in this place, they could tell you a story at least growing up of some type of that's happened to them paranormal wise. This area is so rich in history, especially with coal being the main money maker in this town over the years. That there have been so many families that uh, have died here. So many generations. That and some of the craziest things. Uh, the reason why Harlan got its name Bloody Harlan was because of the Cold War. And then again in the seventies, it was it was bad then too. So you know, and there was a lot of bloodshed then. A lot of people killed uh, back in the twenties and thirties. It was like they these coal companies would hire men to kill families because their workers threatened to quit. And leave, just pack their families up and leave, but the coal companies wouldn't have that. So they would hire them to, you know, go out and kill family members just to put their point across. And that's that has a lot to do, I believe, with a lot of the activity and stuff around here in Harlan. That's that, because of that. That's how Harlan got its name. Uh, I heard it tell last time I was here, and I went home and studied up on it. Someone told me that there were giant human skeletons found in a cave here in Harlan. Yes. Well, apparently, uh, a university in Glasgow, Kentucky, wrote about it. I've, I've found a newspaper article, and I don't know where the skeletons are now, but somebody took possession of those skeletons. They were literally found in a cave here in Harlan. Yes. Yes, he did. That's where I believe that's anything well, we just like heard today be. that the Smithsonian has been accused of, like, taking tanker, like, oil tanker vessels out in the ocean and dumping just boatloads full of giant human skeletons in the Atlantic Ocean to cover up the fact that giant skeletons have been found all across the United States. Well, they don't need to do that. The Bible tells us they were giants. That's why the Smithsonian espouses evolution, and that flies in the face of what they teach and where their money comes from. So you can't really have a bunch of evidence like that. But then we start to get into more of the conspiracy theories there. But it, it, it does really make you go, hmm. I heard another real interesting one today. It, it was on the same same program, but they were talking about they had a giant human skeleton. And this was the time before evolution was really a thing, before Charles Darwin and before Charles Lyell. And they actually had it on display in, I think, the British Museum as an evidence for Genesis and creation. And once the, the theory started coming into play, it just silently disappeared, and uh, they took it off display. Yeah, but I've heard about those skeletons. I have, all my life. Yeah, the giant people saw them. People here in Harlem saw them. Well, there, there's, uh, there's a newspaper article to prove that it was, uh, in fact, something that happened. We're still trying to trace it back to 
where it came from, but we also heard about a bunch of skeletons that were coalified in a cave once. Yes, we tried to uh, we heard the tale once, and uh, I had it on tape, but I can't find uh, my tape again. Uh, must just be them getting old and can't remember. But uh, uh, coalified human remains inside a, a cave. But uh, I appreciate you uh, sharing the story with us. About a month after this interview, we received a call from a very shaken Marcella and her husband James, who had made a rather alarming discovery. The Chadwicks own horses and keep them in a large swath of property on the mountain where they live, and they became very fearful for the safety of their horses when they found a large three-toed footprint with a damaged half-moon-shaped hind footprint. The footprint bears a striking resemblance to the one from the creature that is terrifying the families further up the mountain, and their horses were acting erratic and too fearful to even go into the barn or eat. Could it be that the creatures that Marcella has been investigating and interfering with has caught her scent and followed her and her husband home? I've heard of many instances of dogmen following individuals for many miles to their homes and tormenting them, going so far as to kill their pets, stalk around their property, and even climb on top of their homes. I've heard other accounts so dark and horrendous that I shudder to even think that they could be true. Whatever these dogmen are, more often than not, they seem to seek to terrify and gain a sadistic glee from the fear that they instill in individuals unfortunate enough to encounter them. I often read the fictional works of Dean Koontz, and in a couple of his books he writes of these fictitious beings called the Bodoks, and these creatures that are simply described as goblins because of their goblin-esque appearances, and both of the races of monsters have a deep abiding hatred for humankind, and seem to feed off of human misery and suffering as well as fear. While these creatures are the product of a writer's imagination, the dogmen in many cases seem to mirror their malignant natures and thrill whenever they horrify someone. I have heard of these things tapping on windows and grinning as they terrified some unsuspecting soul. I have even heard of them killing pets and displaying them on the owner's cars and homes, removing the heads of animals and leaving them as warnings of some kind. It is frightening to even speculate what dark motivations some of them, perhaps not all of them, possess. Marcella does a great deal of charity work to help the homeless and hungry in Harlan County, as well as providing for families of minors who have lost their jobs. So she is very loved in the community and has a wide network of friends that deeply love her. And one of those friends happens to be a park ranger at the Daniel Boone National Forest. And she sent photos to this dear friend of hers of the footprints that she had found on her property to see if he could identify it for her. And he became very nervous and told her and her family that he didn't know exactly what the print belonged to, but that they had the same thing in their park and that it was very dangerous and for them not to be out on the property without a large caliber gun with serious knockdown power. And he's called several times over the past few months to give her the same warning and to check in on her. As an update, the timber on Marcel's property has been logged, leaving very few places for something to hide, and her horses have gone unmolested since the forest was clear-cut. The families that were suffering the nightly assaults still sometimes see these upright creatures moving through the forest and hear them screaming their ungodly cries into the night skies. But for the moment, they have not found a way around the tall, electrified fences that surround their properties. The old man down in the holler that Marcella spoke of still refuses to talk about them, fearing that to do so would cause a repeat of whatever happened with them back in the 60s, an event that he doesn't ever want to see a revival of. All of these stories and accounts are, as far as we know, true events. We've seen a few pictures, we've been to a few locations and heard the testimonies, and we intend fully, God willing, to go and spend several days there ourselves and try to bring you any and all evidence that we can find. And if we find no evidence, we'll bring you that as well. But it is hard not to believe that something is going on when you see the fear in a person's eyes as they tell you their story, knowing that they may be accused of being a liar or crazy. 
They can't all be crazy, can they? But how do you explain it? Who could explain it? Who'd believe it? What are these beasts of bloody Harlan with their stories dating back some 60 years ago? 60 years ago. This video was dedicated to the unshakable spirit of the men and women of Harlan County, Kentucky, to those living and those who have passed on to their final rest, or have gotten to know the mystery as some would say. Life has never been easy for those living in Harlan. Whether you consider the physical taxations that wore away at the health of those laboring in the unsafe conditions day after day beneath the surface of the earth, rarely feeling the warmth of the sun down in the coal mines to put lights and heat into the homes of an ungrateful nation, or the bloody feuds that plagued the community, or even the vast majority of people suffering from poverty, the county has always been in a painful struggle as the residents of Harlan struggle to survive. Coal mining has always been a prominent occupation for the good people of Harlan, but that profession has always come with a steep price, as men and women both have sacrificed their health for the safety and well-being of their families that they might provide for them. Many people coming out of the mines were diagnosed with the black lung, an incurable lung ailment created from the inhalation of coal dust, and about a thousand people suffer and die from the effects of black lung every year. Unfortunately, that isn't the only threat that miners have to face, as cave-ins, explosions, and a litany of other dangers have taken many lives in the harvesting of coal from out of the earth. A close friend of mine, who himself dug coal from the bowels of the Appalachian Mountains, expressed the very real danger of coal mining to me. He recalled a very sobering memory of how one of his very own teammates met a grisly and unbefitting end when his head was caught against the cavernous ceiling as they were being conveyed out of the mine in one of the carts used for transportation. Coal mining is never a profession to take lightly and many people in those mountains have no other career options or hopes for a better livelihood for their families. Down in a coal mine, there's generally no such thing as working a 9 to 5 shift. They can potentially be on for 10 days in a row and work an extensive 12 to 16 hour shift, all while enduring grueling physical activities and braving harsh and unforgiving work conditions. I can scarcely imagine how many hours the men and women have collectively invested in those caverns absent the companionship of their own loved ones. Down in the mines, your co-workers and the people that suffer right beside you become like your very family. There is a lasting bond and connection and their heart becomes knit to your own, resulting from the struggles they endure together in the depths of the earth. I imagine that some of the closest friendships that history has ever known has been forged down in the dark of the mines, lasting connections that cannot be severed by time or distance no matter how many years pass, those good people will always be bound by sweat, blood, and suffering as they pass one another along the paths of life. Even though they may never say it, they will silently acknowledge the truth that knits them together. And that truth is, we dug coal together. In 2019, Harlan suffered a devastating blow when the Black Jewel Coal Company went bankrupt and resulted in the layoff of hundreds of good people in the county just before Thanksgiving and Christmas. And to make the situation ever the more bitter, the last paychecks that they would receive ended up bouncing. And numerous people would end up finding that their bank accounts were upwards of $2,000 in the negative. Our dear friends Marcella and James Chadwick devoted themselves to helping the hopeless there in the county by providing multiple means of charity work through their organization, the William Brigman Foundation. In fact, from what I understand, through their love and their kindness, they were able to feed roughly 80 different families at Thanksgiving that had fallen on hard times there in the mountains. They are two beautiful people, and I've seen very few individuals that care more about their fellow man than they do. Almost every time that I talk to Marcella, she is actively carrying out some form of charity to alleviate the suffering of someone less fortunate. The famed Russian novelist, Fyodor Dostoevsky, once made a profound statement that beauty will save the world. And I genuinely believe that statement because through the beauty that is love and simple acts of selflessness and kindness, we can and will save the world. 
and I believe that Marcel and James are doing just that. They are saving the world, one needy soul at a time. So friends, in conclusion, all of us here at the Cryptid Studies Institute would genuinely appreciate if you would take the time, if you feel so moved, to donate to the Chadwick's organization, the William Brigman Foundation. And that again is the William Brigman Foundation, based out of Harlan, Kentucky. Every donation helps, and every donation is much appreciated. I can promise that. We ask nothing for ourselves, and if you decide not to help Marcella's charity, consider finding another group that helps there in the mountains. And if you decide to do nothing, that's alright too. We're grateful that you took the time to watch our video. We love and appreciate each and every one of you, and we are humbled by your support. Thank you for taking the journey with us as we try to understand this phenomenon that is the cryptid realm. And lastly, friends, if you don't mind, please subscribe to us here at the Cryptid Studies Institute and follow our secondary channel, Cryptid Studies Plus, for extra cryptid content. And with that out of the way, friends, this is Elijah Henderson telling you to stay frosty.